This podcast is for healthcare professionals only and is supported by an independent educational grant from ASI Europe Limited. The treatment for advanced endometrial cancer has evolved towards a more targeted approach, but how can we optimize treatment selection to improve patient outcomes? Uh, welcome to this podcast. My name is Georgie Sassan. I'm a medical oncologist at the Christie Hospital in Manchester, UK, and I'm joined by my esteemed colleague. Yeah, my name is Xavier Matias Guiu. I'm a pathologist in Barcelona, Spain, and it's a pleasure for me to be together with Dr. Hassan here. Thank you very much, Javier. So given the significant changes in uh, molecular profiling for endometrial cancer, what do you think is the most effective approach to guide therapy selection in patients with advanced or recurrent endometrial cancer? Yeah, of course, pathology remains very important because pathological features are important in staging. But of course, the molecular classification has emerged as a very important tool for clinicians to take decisions on, on patients. And the molecular classification is based on the TCGA study that was published 10 years ago. This was a very uh, thorough molecular analysis. We are using a surrogate, and the standard protocol for the surrogate is just uh, three immunohistochemical markers and a mutational analysis of one gene that is poly. So with that, we have four subtypes. One is polymutant tumors associated with very good prognosis. Then we have the, the group of tumors with mismatch repair deficiency. Then we have the tumors that are P53 abnormal. And we have finally the tumors that are non-specific molecular profiles because they don't have any of the previously stated molecular alterations. So this is very important. And this is helping clinicians to take decisions. Great. So we've got mismatch repair or MMR testing. And we can also test for microsatellite instability. What do these two tests actually mean? And is one preferred over the other? As I said, what we are doing is a surrogate of the TCGA. And the surrogate is based on, on the easiest techniques. And for mismatch repair testing, immunohistochemistry is the best technique. This is important to remember that this is a surrogate. Surrogate means that nothing is perfect. And of course, immunohistochemistry for mismatch repair deficiency is not perfect. So you can use PCR techniques, but PCR techniques are also not perfect. So there's a 90% correlation in both directions. So in clinical practice, what we do is that we perform immunohistochemistry. It's fast, it's cheaper, but whenever we have doubts, we are, we are performing PCR testing. And with the two of them, I think that we get the, the whole picture of, of each case. Dr. Hassan, with PMMR status observed in the vast majority of patients, what first-line therapeutic options exist? Does prior chemotherapy exposure impact your approach? Uh, very much so. And uh, we take into account the MMR status of all uh, patients, tumors, to decide what would be the optimal treatment for these patients. So broadly speaking, the patients may be classed into proficient MMR or deficient MMR subgroups. 70 to 80% of patients may have the proficient MMR phenotype and 20% uh, with deficient MMR status. For tumors that are deficient in MMR or mismatch repair protein expression, the standard treatment is chemotherapy plus immunotherapy, chemotherapy being platinum-based, and the two common immunotherapy drugs that are used are dostalimab and uh, pembrolizumab. This pathway is not very well established. For patients that are, are of proficient MMR, platinum-based chemotherapy is the standard of care for these patients. The addition of immunotherapy adds some benefit, although it is not to the same magnitude as it is in patients with a deficient MMR status. There's, of course, some new data coming out of uh, combinations of immunotherapy agents with uh, other drugs such as PARP inhibitors, and this may well become a new standard of care in the very near future. For patients with a proficient MMR status that make up the vast majority of the advanced endometrial cancer population, chemotherapy with platinum and a non-platinum agent such as paclitaxel is the standard of care. 
However, at the time of a relapse, there is um, strong data from the keynote trial to confirm that a combination of pembrolizumab with a multiple tyrosine kinase inhibitor, lenvatinib, is highly effective in terms of keeping the disease under control and for making patients uh, live longer. And this is now the established standard of care for these patients. It is also worth noting that there was a first-line trial of chemotherapy versus pembrolizumab and lenvatinib, the LEAP001 trials. While this study showed, uh, broadly speaking, similar outcomes with these two uh, types of treatment, it is worth noting that for a subset of patients within this trial who had had previous chemotherapy, the benefit or the outcomes of these patients with pembrolizumab and lenvatinib were far superior to chemotherapy. And for that reason, pembrolizumab and lenvatinib should be considered the standard of care for any patient with advanced or recurrent endometrial cancer who may have received platinum-based chemotherapy at some point in the past. Yeah, so it seems that mismatch repair testing is really crucial in this uh, in your uh, scheme. So I think that both of us agree that uh, nowadays mismatch repair deficiency can be should be established uh, when the patient is diagnosed, either at the biopsy or at the specimen, because this is really really important. But also also since there are there is a subset of patients in which there is change in the status upon progression, I think it's very important whenever this is possible, whenever this is possible, testing at, at progression and also testing also for estrogen receptor because this is another marker that is sometimes changing during progression of the disease. Do you agree with that? Absolutely. Um, and I think the uh, implication of uh, MMR testing uh, is different in earlier stages of disease as compared to advanced stages. In stage 1 to stage 3 endometrial cancer, we use MMR testing alongside P53 status to help us determine which patients may benefit from adjuvant treatment. Whereas in patients with advanced disease, we use that, of course, to test their suitability for uh, an immunotherapy agent alongside chemotherapy or combination of immunotherapy, uh, pembrolizumab in combination with lenvatinib. Very good. So, so PMMR is really a heterogeneous group of tools. Indeed, it is. And, uh, and I think we obviously need to look into that into, in more detail in the future uh, to help us identify further subsets of patients that will respond better to treatment. Dr. Hassan, do you think it is important to explain the results of the molecular classification to patients? And how do you do that in your clinical practice? Oh, yes, absolutely. It's, it's very important that we involve patients in our decision-making process right at the outset and explain to them fully what the molecular genetics of their particular tumor are so we can tailor treatment specifically to individual patients. We do that um, by undertaking reflex testing at the time of diagnosis, and a full discussion is had uh, with our patients when they first come to see us in the medical oncology clinic. And during the course of their discussion, they're supported by the specialist nurse or key worker with some written information as well to explain the implications of uh, the results of these tests, both for their treatment and also if there's an underlying genetic predisposition to certain cancers associated with Lynch syndrome for some of these patients. So maybe we can take some uh, takeaway messages from our discussion, uh, Dr. Hassan, so, and maybe... Some of the conclusions that we can take is that mismatch repair status should be tested in all patients at diagnosis and upon disease progression to guide personalized treatment decision. Immunotherapy and chemotherapy combinations, including maintenance or laparib, demonstrate benefits in patients with non-DMR advanced recurrent endometrial cancer with greater efficacy observed in the DMMR population. And lembatinib plus pembrolizumab is a viable option, not only as second-line therapy, but also as first-line therapy in, for patients with non-DMMR advanced recurrent endometrial cancer who have progressed after prior systemic therapy in any settings. 
And of course, shared decision making supported by patient education is essential for optimizing the treatment outcomes. I completely agree with your assessment. I think um, uh, molecular profiling and personalized therapy is the future for all cancer treatments. Uh, we've made substantial progress in endometrial cancer, and uh, I completely agree that there's more to come on this. But thank you all very much for listening. If you enjoyed this podcast and want to find out more, then please look for the Obstetrics and Gynecology Medical Conversation podcast under the account of Core to Add Medical Education. Also, don't forget to rate this podcast, subscribe to our channel and share it with your colleagues. Thank you for listening and see you next time. This podcast is an initiative of Core to Add and developed by Obstetrics and Gynecology Connect, a group of international experts working in the field of obstetrics and gynecology. The views expressed are the personal opinions of the experts, and they do not necessarily represent the views of the experts' organizations or the rest of the Obstetrics and Gynecology Connect group. For expert disclosures on any conflict of interest, please visit the Core2Head website.